All right, so the topic is ethics and writing. It's something to be aware of as you venture further and further into your writing studies. So what do I mean by ethics in the context of writing? Um, well, I'm not a philosopher or an ethicist, but I'm talking about morals. So something could be legally okay but not morally okay and something could be morally okay to a person but not legally okay so I do want to different differentiate ethics from legality and in the context of writing I'm talking about basically what is right and what is fair in the context of writing about others or observing others or researching about others. So in the digital environment when we write it actually has the ability to be shared widely with the public and can be very permanent. So uh, in class we kind of assume that it's just us reading what we write, but we can't really know what's going on in each person's life. If other people are using a computer or, you know, you just can't really know what's happening. So because of that, and just because in general, it's important to know that there is an ethical component to writing. I just want to give a bit of a frame for that. Um, so there are some regulations, so here we're talking about laws actually, that protect people who are the subjects of research. Now why am I even talking about this? Well because there is research to do possibly in class, such as interviewing a person or taking their oral history, um, there's research of books and written texts and that isn't considered a research participant. So I'm referring to human beings. And then we have to think farther than that, not just research but just talking about something that happened to us but it, it could involve something sensitive and so if others are involved there might be it might be you know legally okay to include the other people's identifying information but maybe that's not the right thing to do because they didn't give their permission to tell that particular story that involved them so it's just something to think about but to back up the underlying issues, to give some extreme examples, there are some events that happened historically in the United States and elsewhere that caused civilization to become aware that human beings who are being researched and written about might need some protection. So back in 1946, uh, there was something called the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, if you're a uh, World War II fan, you may know about this. Um, it was an international military tribunal that tried to look at Nazi doctors who conducted horrific, unethical experiments on concentration camp prisoners during the Holocaust. And out of that came the Nuremberg Code, which is a set of international ethical guidelines for conducting research with humans. There were also examples of research with questionable ethics going on in the United States. In 1966, Henry Beecher, an anesthesiologist and researcher, published a widely cited New England Journal of Medicine article detailing numerous examples of unethical experiments involving human subjects that were conducted at various U.S. institutions. For example, one of these experiments was purposely exposing children in a home to the hepatitis virus. 
to see if they would indeed get hepatitis. That's just one of them I remember. In 1972, there was widespread media coverage of the syphilis study in Tuskegee, Alabama. You may have heard of the Tuskegee study. Beginning in the 1930s and continuing for decades, U.S. government doctors studied the progression of untreated syphilis in poor African-American men. The doctors did not tell the men they had syphilis and prevented them from learning of their diagnosis, and they did not offer treatment even after penicillin became available. So this is just a partial timeline of the Tuskegee study. Um, it began in 1932 and it went on and you can read about this more. It's, there's a lot of information about it on the web if you're interested. I want to differentiate the Tuskegee study from a couple of other well-known Tuskegee related um, institutions or groups of people. So there is a university called Tus Tuskegee University, which you may have heard of. It is a private historically black university in Tuskegee, Alabama. It's a historic site. And it was home to George Washington Carver and to the, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. That is a separate thing from this study that happened. And then also, oh, this is a picture of it some of the men involved in the Tuskegee study. The Tuskegee Airmen is also not the study. So that was a group of primarily African American military pilots who fought in World War II. So that's a separate thing too. There's a picture of the pilots. Now we're back to the Tuskegee study again. So these are the men that were being studied. Um, recently Relatively recently, it's been written about again or been remembered, the Tuskegee study, because uh, the distrust that developed between the African American community and mainstream medical community um, was theorized as being a reason why there was some difficulty um, when COVID came around getting vaccinations into the African-American population. So, you might be interested in that or not. Um, because of this need to protect research participants that came from the public outcry, there was a report which laid down the ethical principles to protect research participants. These were laid out in the Belmont Report. And it was published in 1979. Okay, so from these, this whole idea to protect research participants, universities and colleges became involved or became part of who had to be concerned about research participants because especially research universities like, for example, Michigan State University, they are regularly doing um, research on human beings, including, I'm talking about interviewing people, observing people, um, doing a kind of experiment where there's a control group who is just proceeding normally and then there's the experimental group who's getting some kind of treatment. It could be they're writing every day or it could be they're getting some kind of a shot. You know, there, there's medical treatments that are tested and exper experimented upon people um, at research universities such as, you know, to see if a vaccination is effective. One group would get a placebo, another group would get a vaccination. So there are regulations for any kind of institution that receives federal funding that they have to uh, have an institutional review board and, they, and a group of people have to review a study to make sure it's ethical and then the individuals who are being studied have to offer, they have to sign an informed consent. So here I have screen captures from LCC's Human Subjects Institutional Review Board page and then Michigan State. So if you go on 
to get uh, a four-year degree, a master's, or you want to be in the medical field, or, or so on, you will at some point be asked to take like a tutorial from an institutional review board and then take a little test. It's not very difficult so that you are, are aware of the things that we're talking about today, but they go into more depth, of course. And then um, if, you're, if you are in a situation where you're going to do a study, say you want to learn about um, how Black Lives Matter is perceived in some community, and you're going to interview people at a church. Uh, that would all need to be described, and there would need to be a document that the people who are going to be interviewed sign, and they would have to be told what the study was about and how it was going to be published and so on. And then that would have to be saved, those documents would have to be saved for the future. So we're not doing that level of human research in this class. And so we're not going to worry about IRBs at this point, institutional review boards. But I want you to be aware of it. So there's a sample inter interview release form in our materials um, or online. And so this is something that it's just good to be aware of. If, if you're a person that makes uh, digital videos or like are an influencer or something, and you're going to interview somebody, it's good to get kind of a release form that they know that, that they're, they're going to put, that their talk or whatever they're doing is going to be put online. So that's a good thing to do. It's ethical. All right, so in the class, what we want to think about is if we're talking about something sensitive, um, then it's a good idea to maybe disguise, like you can create a fake name or a pseudonym for a place of employment. You can create a fake name or pseudonym for people. So you basically disguise them. So, you know, I had a student once, this was before, this was like a decade before marijuana was legal in Michigan, but he or she, I can't remember now, was writing about someone who grew marijuana like in a local area and they named that person's first and last name in a paper. So that's an example of what not to do is to name somebody by name and because you're using them as an example of somebody who's doing something illegal. Um, unless you want the public to potentially know about that, which, you know, it depends on what the situation is. But so just think about um, disguising people's names if it's a sensitive subject, and you can do that. I'll give you some examples here. Thank you.